We will let the children go downstairs for Sunday school. Let's turn first of all to Lord's Day 15 in the back of our forms booklets. So turn to page 216. Lord's Day 15, page 216. It's always neat when the sermon in the worship service dovetails with the teaching service and and you see that as it will happen this morning we're going to meditate on what it means that Jesus suffered that of course it fits exactly with what Jesus was saying and that is the benefit of telling you that God's truth is singular is one truth one Lord one faith and and so there's a an encouragement for the soul as we see this the unity um, and, and we would expect that. God's the author of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, so there's one message. And so you look at the diamond from this angle and that angle, but it's still the same diamond. Tonight, or today, we're going to look at what it means that he suffered. We're going to conf- we confess that in the Creed. Suffered under Pontius Pilate. So page 216, question 37 asks, what do you understand by the word suffered? The answer is, that during his whole life on earth, but especially at the end, Christ sustained in body and soul the wrath of God against the sin of the whole human race. This he did in order that by his suffering as the only atoning sacrifice, he might deliver us body and soul from eternal condemnation and gain for us God's grace, righteousness, and eternal life. Question 38, why did he suffer under Pontius Pilate as judge? so that he, though innocent, might be condemned by an earthly judge and so free us from the severe judgment of God that was to fall on us. Question 39. Is it significant that he was crucified instead of dying some other way? Yes. By his death, this death, I am convinced that he shouldered the curse which lay on me since death by crucifixion was cursed by God. So you might uh, keep that handy, and we're going to turn to the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25, very beautiful words from Peter. All right, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, He did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were strain like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Peter here says in a couple of places there, Uh, Verse 21, that Christ suffered for you, and then he explains some of those sufferings. Verse 23, when he suffered, he did not threaten. Speaks about his sufferings in verse 24 that he bore in his body on the tree. So we're going to meditate on that this morning as we consider what we confess in the creed that Jesus Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate and that he was crucified. The next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at what follows next, um, the significance of the fact that he died and was buried. <clears throat> the church confesses that Jesus Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate. It is just as a, an entry point rather interesting that in this very famous creed of the church, and it's not inspired, 
but it is a creed that the church has endorsed and accepted and recited for hundreds of years. And it's interesting the names that make it into this famous creed. We have the Virgin Mary on the one hand, and we have Pontius Pilate on the other hand, a famous and an infamous person, uh, respectively. Our first point is Jesus Christ suffered for sin. And if you have your bulletins, you'll see that um, these are the notes or these are the points. Jesus Christ suffered for sin. And then we see that he suffered it um, according to God's justice. He suffered it throughout his life. He suffered it body and soul. And he suffered God's wrath against the whole human race. He suffered for sin under Pontius Pilate. He suffered sin to the point of crucifixion. And then if we have time, we'll look at the stages of humiliation and exaltation. Here's our question. Why was it necessary for Jesus to suffer in order to pay for our sins? Very narrowly, why was suffering necessary? And what the Bible tells us is that he had to suffer for sin because that was a requirement of God's justice. It is according to God's justice that there can be no salvation without atonement. What's atonement? Atonement is payment for sin. What does payment of sin require? It requires suffering. Suffering for sin and then dying for sin. I think I actually wrote that if you flip the page as I just did, you'll see that um, maybe they're already ahead of me, but um, I had written that out just to keep it clear and present it to us carefully. In accordance with God's justice, there can be no salvation without atonement. Atonement is payment for sin. Payment for sin involves being punished for it, which includes both suffering and death. The point we're making is that justice requires that crimes be punished. Since God is righteous and just, any salvation that he provides for us must be in accordance with God's nature. He must be able to satisfy his justice when he saves us from our sins. So theologians in the early ages of the church and middle ages, they, they pondered over whether or not God could simply decree away our sin just by divine fiat, just say, you're forgiven. Just make a declaration, like, let there be light, and there is light, you are forgiven, you're forgiven. And they say, they call that consequent hypothetical necessity of the atonement. And they said, some actually believed it, but most were saying, that can't be true. God can't just decrease in a way. He must absolve sin in a manner that agrees with his character. Um, here's an example. If I were to steal a pickup and return it the next morning, do I get away free? No. I returned it in the same condition. I returned it with the fuel tank full, but I stole it. It looks as if I borrowed it, but I didn't ask for it. I stole it. And then I had remorse and regret like Judas, and I returned it the next morning. Should I be, um, should the cops come and arrest me? Have I committed a felony? Yeah. It's not enough to simply bring the pickup back and park it in the driveway. I have committed a moral offense. I have taken what was not mine. I have seized it and made it my own. I have offended my neighbor's rights and possessed what was not mine to possess. It's not enough to simply return it. Our own understanding of justice means that there needs to be payment. Some form of punishment needs to be exacted upon me because I committed a moral offense. Today, our courts have shied away from a punitive view of justice. Punitive comes from that Latin word, 
um, penal or like a penal colony. It refers to punishment. And our courts today have, 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 uh, have shied away from any kind of a view of punitive justice. Justice should not be a punishment. It should be rehabilitative. The design of the jails and the prisons is to rehabilitate and get that person back into society. But justice involves punishment for moral offenses because God is just, and that's in accordance with his character. It is a, uh, justice involves a punishment uh, um, in order to make the guilty person pay for his crime. So here's, as we go from this analogy, our sins are moral crimes against God, which demand punishment. God cannot, by divine fiat, just declare us forgiven. Our sins require punishment, just as my stealing requires punishment in kind. Punishment requires suffering, and if there is no suffering, there is no punishment. Think about that for a moment. Punishment, by definition, requires suffering. If there is no suffering, if I get arrested because I stole uh, my neighbor's pickup, and the cops just say, okay, um, you're arrested, and now you go back home, and I just live like I had lived the day before. Have I suffered at all? No, there's no suffering. Where there's no suffering, there's no punishment. So our sins require punishment, and punishment necessitates there be suffering involved. If we are going to be saved from our sins, we need someone to suffer for our sins. Even if you read the theologians throughout the ages, they had different theories about the atonement. The moral influence theory was one of them, for example. Why did Jesus die on the cross? To, to uh, make us be sacrificial toward people, right? That was the moral influence theory. And so theologians wrestled with this, like why did he have to suffer and die? And, and good theologians came to the point that he had to suffer because our sins required it. God cannot atone for guilt without that guilt being paid for. And so here's one of the best places we can go is Isaiah 53. We read Peter. Peter talks about Jesus suffering. But one of the classic, the classic text in the Bible on the suffering required for salvation is this beautiful chapter in Isaiah 53. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter for the sake of time, but I want your eyes to see the suffering that is going on here. I was told in seminary that in the Jewish synagogues today, they skip this chapter. I've never confirmed that, but that's what I've been told because they don't know what to do with it. But we have here the Messiah who is called a suffering servant. So Isaiah has four suffering servant songs. This one actually begins in chapter 52, if, if my memory is correct. Go to 52 verse 13. Behold my servant. So this is one of the suffering servant songs of Isaiah. And this servant of Yahweh, as you look at him in, in chapter 53, let's just see what our eyes glance upon. I'm seeing verse 3. He was despised, rejected, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Uh, we see him stricken, smitten, afflicted, verse 4, from God. He's, he's wounded, he's crushed. He's chastised. Verse 5, stripes are laid upon his back. He's, he's whipped. And uh, verse 7, he's oppressed. He's afflicted like a lamb that is being brought to the slaughter. So some of you men in agriculture know what that's like, bringing, bringing your, your livestock to the slaughter. Oppression and, and judgment, he was taken away. So we could go on through all of these verses, but you see in Isaiah 53 this this very powerful testimony to the fact that our atonement comes through 
suffering. And, and we know that that's Jesus. He is described as the man of sorrows. So I'm just looking at some bullet points. God can only save sinners in a manner consistent with his nature. And Isaiah refers to the Savior as a man of sorrows. The suffering that he experienced was the wrath of God that was against us, that was laid upon him. Uh, so we read that in Romans chapter 5, that God's wrath was laid upon his son. We read in Romans chapter 3 that God put forward Jesus as a propitiation by his blood. That's the next bullet point. Propitiation is used in Romans chapter 3. It's used in 1 John. It's a word that Paul liked to use, and it means the satisfaction of wrath. See, I think sometimes, you know, why can't God just forgive sin? Just, oh, divine fiat. Well, if somebody just abuses somebody you love, you just can't say, oh, I forgive you. Now, right, the Bible talks about a husband filled with a, with a jealous anger. There's that wrath, a holy wrath. And our sins are moral offenses against God, and it, it provokes right away that, that jealous anger that we have rebelled against God. His wrath is provoked. And so where there's wrath, there's going to be suffering. Where there is wrath, there is going to be punishment. Where there's wrath, there's going to be stripes. There's going to be curses. There's going to be all of the things we're reading in Isaiah uh, 53, griefs and sorrows and wounds. Where there's wrath, there's going to be sorrow, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Propitiation is what Jesus does at the cross. He drinks the cup of God's wrath down to the dregs. We could not and cannot be forgiven unless Jesus suffer the consequence of our moral offenses against God. His sufferings were infinitely more intense because he was the sinless son of God. Um, think of it like this by way of analogy. Uh, if you are blown by, and this is an analogy I did not think of, uh, so I'm borrowing it, but it works. If you are, if you are blown by hurricane force winds and you're just carried along with it, there's very little resistance. But if you are walking into that hurricane force wind, there is a ton of resistance. And that's similar to what Jesus Christ is doing. He is not going with the flow. He is standing against all of that wrath he is being pushed into it. And so you see that him being, us being sinful, we would just be carried along with it. But he is the one who, who stands in the face of those gale force winds of God's wrath and endures that suffering in our place. The suffering of Jesus Christ, next bullet point, is called his passive obedience. And so... What that word passive means, it comes from a Latin word. Everything goes back to the Latin. Um, patior is the Latin that means to suffer. And we call it his passive obedience because he was receptive of it. We speak about his active obedience as his actually obeying the commandments. But his passive obedience is as he, he bears the full brunt of God's infinite wrath against us. He does that for us and in our place. I used the word before, um, penal substitution. That's the Latin. I wasn't thinking of it. Poena is the Latin word that means penalty. So the theories of the atonement, this is the one that the Reformed camp settled upon. What's going on at the cross is a penal substitution. He is suffering the penalty of our sins, and that penalty meant a lot of suffering. We could not be forgiven unless he suffered. It wasn't um, enough for him simply just to die. We'll look at that in a moment. 
Cecile Francis Alexander writes in a beautiful hymn about the cross. We have it in our hymnal, There is a Green Hill Far Away. She writes, There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. And we confess it in our creed that, that Jesus Christ was the only atoning sacrifice. He's the only one who could suffer in our place. Any other human would be extinguished by the weight of God's divine wrath. Not all the blood of bulls and goats, Hebrews says, could ever atone for a single sin. There was no one good enough. There was no one strong enough. There was no one pure enough. There was no one righteous enough to suffer in our place. So Jesus Christ suffered for you and for me so that we could be forgiven. He suffered 1.2 throughout his life. Hebrews 5 speaks about Jesus' suffering being evident by loud cries and tears. Um, I'm going to turn there for a second because my memory isn't going to be good enough on this one. Listen to this. In the days of his flesh, that means throughout his life, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Jesus cried a lot, not just from the cross, but throughout his life. He felt the crushing weight of our sin bearing down upon his soul. We see the wisdom of God here designed in our salvation because think, of, ask yourself this question, Jesus Christ came to Abraham and had lunch with him to tell him that his wife Sarah would have a baby. Jesus took on flesh, had dinner, and then went back to heaven. Why couldn't he just come down, say, all right, folk, I'm the Lamb of God, let's get this over with, and go back up to heaven? Sweet, minimal suffering, bad enough as it is, but let's not drag it out. Why was it necessary that the Son of God start off as an embryo with the weight, crushing weight of my sin and yours on his soul and carry that burden through childhood, adolescence, and adulthood? Part of the wisdom of God is that Christ here in this fashion, there's multiple reasons, but one of them pertaining to this is that he bears the burden of our guilt in each of the stages of our own life. In our mother's womb, we were already guilty and condemned. Being inheriting the original sin of our parents who got it from their parents and all the way back to Adam. And he bore that original sin, not his own, for he is sinless, but ours. And the temper tantrums of a two-year-old who refuses to have their, baby, their diaper changed. And he bears their sin. And he bears our, our squabbles as children when we were five years old and we were bickering about who's going to do the dishes and all the arguments and words that are thrown around at the dinner table. And he bears the sins of our childhood and he bears the sins of our adulthood. And it is something for us to stand back for a moment and just realize that he bore our sins he carried our sorrows, and because of that, he suffered throughout his life. He was different than his brothers, who happily and merrily played along in the streets. But even as he had his own growing awareness that he was the Messiah, there was also with that a growing awareness that he was the lamb, the sacrificial victim. Before we confess that Jesus died for me, we confess that Jesus suffered for me. He suffered throughout his life. He suffered 1.3 in body and in soul. As we read in the Bible in 1 Peter chapter 2, that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. In Greek grammar, that's called a synecdoche, a part for the whole, which means by saying he, he bore our sins in his body, 
He bore our sins in himself, in his mind, in his, his conscience, his will, his heart, his spirit, his soul. Uh, I think, for example, of these verses from Isaiah 53. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, out of the anguish of his soul, he poured out his soul to death. So we are believing that the punishment that was due us was laid upon him and he experienced that punishment, that penalty in his body and in his soul. His sufferings match what he atones. Remember I quoted Gregory of Nazianzus last week. Christ has not redeemed what he has not assumed. He assumed our bodies and souls to save our bodies and souls, which of course requires that he suffer in body and soul. Jesus Christ suffered in his body and in his soul. More about that here in a moment. He suffered God's wrath against the whole human race. The, the Apostles' Creed is not Arminian in its theology, saying here that Jesus Christ actually laid down atonement for all people um, in the sense that all, were, all are saved, you know, and, and then they just have to accept it or reject it. That would be the Arminian view. What the, what the, the um, Creed is simply saying here is, that Jesus Christ suffered for all humanity. Not just Jews, but also Gentiles, Romans, not just free men, but also slaves, women, children, and men. He suffered the sins for the sins of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So we're confessing that Jesus Christ suffered for us. And that suffering was required, apart from which we could not be forgiven. Somebody had to pay, and he paid dearly. We also confess that he suffered under Pontius Pilate. And now this is actually a very um, thing that we need to think about here, even if briefly. Why was it necessary that Jesus Christ be condemned by an earthly judge? Why, for example, um, couldn't the Jews have just hired a lynchman to just kill him in a back alley? Just take him out, kill him in his sleep. Because Romans 13 tells us that judges and governors are God's ministers. And so when Pilate condemns Jesus, he does so not as Pontius Pilate, but he does so as God's servant. And though Pontius Pilate three times asserted that Jesus was innocent in himself, we know he wasn't. Because our sins made him guilty. And so Pilate's decision that is at face value unjust is God's just decision. For God made him who knew no sin to be guilty. Because when my sin is placed on him, he becomes guilty. He becomes the sinner, not by his own, but by imputation. God made him a new no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what's glorious about this belief about um, Jesus Christ suffering under Pontius Pilate is the fact that Pilate here was, was sentencing uh, Jesus to death on behalf of God as God's representative. You see why this is actually a powerful thing we need to confess? is because when we say he suffered under Pontius Pilate, what we are saying is that this was an execution of divine justice. Now that doesn't mean that every judge's decision agrees with God's decision. 
but it does mean that here. It means that what Pilate did, he did on behalf of God. That the human verdict of the judge Pilate was the same verdict of the divine judge, God. Jesus had this conversation with Pilate and he alluded to it. He said to Pilate, he says, you would have no authority unless it had been given you from above. What was Jesus saying? What you do, Pilate, has been given you to do from above. You will sentence me, though you know I'm innocent, to a most cruel crucifixion because your sentence is the sentence of God. This is so good for our souls because it assures you that Jesus' suffering was a satisfaction of justice, divine justice. And so for your heart and mine, that's the assurance that he really did pay the price. If he's way late in the back alley, who's to know what's going on there? But he suffers at Pilate, Pilate's um, direction. One point, or number three, he suffered uh, to the point of crucifixion. Why was it critical for Jesus to die by crucifixion and not by stoning, which was the customary form of Jewish execution? <clears throat> Well, this is actually very interesting. It also um, dovetails into what we said about Pontius Pilate. Some are prone to find the significance of the crucifixion by its um, unique painfulness. Um, One of the reasons why I strongly discourage people from watching movies of the Passion is at face value, at the very least, they're very misguided, and at worst, they're blasphemy because it, it, it appeals to the shock value of the painfulness of nails and all that kind of stuff and whipping. Guess what? Peter was, or Paul was whipped more times than Jesus. Five times. Many other people lit up the streets of Rome being crucified like Jesus was. So these movies about the death of Jesus are just bad. Don't even bother your soul with that. Why was it significant that he was crucified? Not because of the sheer torture value, which it was the most torturous way to death, but it was critical for two reasons. The customary way Jews got rid of their criminals was by stoning. But if he had been stoned, his death would not have been a legitimate sacrifice for us. Since the party authorized to execute him was not the Sanhedrin, but the Roman governor. God is all about being exact. And so if Jesus is going to be a perfect substitute, a penal substitute, the Sanhedrin cannot give that verdict because the Sanhedrin said to Pilate in John chapter 18, we don't have the authority to execute him. So if they executed him, Has his death had any value or any merit? If if I steal your pickup and you decide to just beat me up behind the woodshed, has that been justice? No. No, we need need the legal authorities who wear the badges and the titles and sit in the bench to say you're guilty and you're going to jail. There's no justice being done when, when you take matters into your own hands. If the Sanhedrin did it, there's no justice. So it can't be stoning. It has to be through the legitimate authority. And the legitimate authority says, here's how we deal with bad characters. We crucify them. So that's the first point. His death for crucifixion, by crucifixion, was necessary because it was the form of execution given by the legitimate authority, Rome. Rome needed to decide his fate, not Jerusalem, because Rome was in power. And so what we have going on here is that, and that's actually, the the Jews were smart. That's why they didn't stone him. 
is because they, the Pharisees and Sadducees, needed to legitimate his death. Because you know what's going on? If they took him out in the back alley and killed him, what would that have done? Everybody would have said, oh, he was a good man. They just didn't like him. But the judge, the Roman governor, Rome executed him. They legitimized Jesus' death. And so that was very critical, that Jesus Christ die under the direction of Rome. And that direction required death by crucifixion. Additionally, this is what the Catechism picks up on. The significant thing about this form of death, and we get this in, in Deuteronomy and we get this in Galatians 3, is this, and it's that crucifixion was not only the most torturous way to die, but theologically, it represented being cursed. Cursed is the person who dies on the tree. Heaven cursed him, earth cursed him, nobody wanted him. He hung between the two, rejected by both. And so for our faith, what we're confessing here is not how torturous it was, which it was, but what we're confessing is here is a legitimate death by the authorized authority who has issued a verdict that God has agreed with. Here is the man, the son of man, who suffered for us. Pilate condemned him because God condemned him. God, in fact, cursed him. That's the meaning of the cross. And so, for you and for me, as we think about Jesus' sufferings, as we think about him suffering on the cross like this, we have this great additional comfort that divine justice was satisfied. You know, some of you know I went to... Uh, Alco with the girls this week, and, and uh, God gave me the opportunity to talk to one of the vendors, and he was LDS, and tell him I'm a pastor, and I'm here with my girls, and we start talking. He's like, yeah, you know, we believe, uh, he didn't say he was Mormon, but anybody would know that he's LDS, because he says, you know, we believe that, you know, God saved us after all that we can do. When they throw that in there, you know, LDS, after all that we can do. I said, that's, such, that's so dishonoring to Christ. If there's anything that we could contribute to our redemption, then God wasted the life of his son. He should have just given us more time. Let us be like Methuselah, live for 900 years, give us more time and more skill, and, and we'll, we'll do our best. We had nothing we could add. The only thing we give to redemption is our sin. And so... Camping on this today, the legitimate suffering of a substitute gives you this confidence. God's justice has been satisfied. We don't add anything. Jesus Christ has paid it all. The stages of his humiliation are simply this, we'll get to it again, but it begins with his conception, his birth, his life ministry, the suffering under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried. And so we're working our way through those stages of humiliation. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. Jesus Christ has suffered for us and he wanted to do it. That's the beauty of this gospel. It was his joy. He didn't do it reluctantly. He said, like Isaiah said, here I am, send me. He has loved us so much, he was willing to suffer to the point of death on a cross so that we might be the Father's children. Amen. Let's sing a beautiful...